In Memory of Dick Robinson and sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. I'm Kate DiCamello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. I'm here to talk about The Beatrice Prophecy, uh, which is a book that I had the huge honor of working with Sophie Blackle, uh, who did all of the art for the book. Sophie, hello. Welcome to the National Book Festival. Hello, Kate, and hello, everyone who's watching, and I wish we could actually see you, but soon we will. One day soon we will, and what a joy that will be. Um, but in the meantime, it's no small pleasure to be here with Kate to talk about this book that I love so much. And I'm I'm supposed to tell you what it's about, which is no easy feat. Uh, because... Oh, let's do it together, Sophie. Okay. Let's do right. it together. Yes, this is the sort of thing that grown ups sit in a in a room for weeks and months, and they think about every sentence and every word. Um, and in fact, really, we just want you to to read this book. Um, it's about a kid called Beatrice. This is this is Beatrice, um, and this goat called Answelica. And, right. and they're the most important people, but there are some other people as well. Yes, and there there are prophecies, and there are stories, and there are wolves, and there are princesses, and there's uh, bees, and and um, there That's are amazing. kings who are no longer kings. And you know what I find, Sophie, and it's interesting. I wonder if you've had this experience. This book doesn't come out uh, until September, and I find that I don't know how to talk about a book until I go out and talk to the readers of the book. So it's just like, I wrote it, you did the gorgeous illustrations. I won't fully understand it until I stand in front of a kid and talk right. to uh, a kid who has read the book. Then, then I start to, to understand it. So at this point, it's really hard for us to sum up what it's about exactly. because we don't know that. Yeah. It's sort of easier in a way to talk about how this book made me feel when I read it for the first time, which was that I everything else in the world fell away, and which is what happens to me when I'm reading the best kind of book, the, the kind of book that I feel is written just for me, that is, that is a story that is completely consuming, that you step into that world and you don't want to leave it. And in a way, even after you've closed that last page and put the book down, you're still in that world. And that's how I feel very much with Beatrice. I, I feel that, um, that, if, that at any point I could imagine myself up the tree where Beatrice and her friend Jack Dory uh, have climbed and Anne Swellica is waiting from at the bottom or inside the tree later on where they go into someone who has actually made a house inside a tree or when they're walking through the forest or when they're going through the, the, the field, the meadow full of flowers. There are so many different parts of this world that are, that are kind of still with me and I can imagine myself there all the time, which is a very nice thing. You, you, that's that that makes me want to enter that book <laughs> and <laughs> and also it, it it does this sophie it makes me think of like one of the most powerful moments um i was a huge reader as a kid but i just remember that absolute rightness of lucy pushing on the wardrobe door how it mm. it the feels snow. It's one of the most profound moments um, for me as a reader. And so what you, as you were saying all that, I had that feeling of like this, this ordinary thing leads to someplace extraordinary. I was one of those kids who um, was desperate to learn how to read. I knew that what was in books was something that I needed. I was lucky enough to have a mother who read to me, but um, I also, uh, for whatever reason, struggled um, learning to read. And the, the book that I was holding when everything kind of coalesced and it became a story was uh, Little Bear. Um, it, with I can never say that author's 
name, Maurice Sendak, did the illustrations. And I remember um, a long time ago, I was speaking and I got up on a stage after Maurice Sendak and I couldn't even look at him because those uh, that artwork of Little Bear is so profound to me that it makes me cry. I mean, it's just like this all body experience. The world opened up. I under I was in that book and um, and I've never looked back. So, yeah. My sketching, drafting, imagining process is different with every book that I work on, which is both exciting and terrifying. Um, and sometimes uh, sometimes I just get into a sort of total paralysis and just stare at a blank page and can't do a thing. And other times I can see it so clearly in my head. Um, and I talk to a lot of uh, people who, who draw about about this this particular thing where you can see something so clearly in your head and you start to draw it and you think, I've got this, I have got this, it's, this is gonna be the best picture in the world and you start to draw it and it doesn't look anything like the thing in your head. Um, it's the, I remember the first time I tried to draw a horse and I could see this galloping horse with its gorgeous mane and its flowing tail and its nostrils and, and what came out kind of looked like a like a, a deer that had been made out of you know um, bread dough. It was it was lumpy. It was there was no nothing streaming flowing, nothing majestic about my lumpy bread dough deer. Um, but I had to learn to love my lumpy bread dough deer and uh, and embrace it for what it was. And and that's for me the whole process of of drawing is uh, recognizing my limitations. Um, and then um, sitting with them for a little while, trying to make them better if I can, and then and then embracing them. Because um, I feel, and Kate and I talked about this a bit, uh, I feel that I only have so much control over them, which also sounds a bit like a cop-out, like, oh, I didn't finish my whole homework because I only have so much control. Um, uh, it's, it's that I... I start to draw and then and then I can't actually physically draw what's in my head. So I draw this thing that my hands can do, which is which is their version of the thing that's in my head. And 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 then that's that, that's what comes out. And I do it a lot and I try to practice and get better at it. But um, but but sometimes I step back and I don't fully remember making all of the drawing as though my brain wasn't really talking to my hand, as though one part was was taking over. Um, a little more forcefully than the other. Sophie, it, it, that when I, um, to, to draft something out is you use the word terrifying. Mm. It's terrifying for me. And, um, and I know that feeling of it because it's, a uh, Ann Patchett, the novelist had written a beautiful essay a long time ago about how you carry this idea around in your head, this beautiful novel in your head and then the minute that you sit down and write the very first word of it you've compromised your vision because it's never as beautiful as it is in your head and so part of making any kind of art whether it's story or or actual art like you do i think is learning to be comfortable with how it's never going to be perfect and it's never going to be this wondrous thing that's in your head. And you learn that it's not perfect, but you want it to go out into the world anyway. And sometimes I think the imperfections are how readers um, and um, people who are looking find their way in because it's more human that way. If you were to write an absolutely perfect story or an absolutely or draw a, a flawless piece of art, it's almost not human. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and so absolutely. it's okay that it's not coming out perfect, but it it you you work to make it as good as you can and then you let it go. And that's that's what I learn every time I do a story. What I love is not one particular one, but rather I have learned to embrace the process. So every horse is first a lumpy red doe deer to go with Sophie's analogy. And what I've learned to love is the fact that I can take that lumpy red doe deer. And if I'm willing to show up and work and listen to the deer that is hidden at the, the you know, the beautiful horse that's hidden inside of that 
then I can make it better and better. And so I've learned to love it that way. I've learned to love it by process. Because when you sit down and, and you want to write a story, you want it to come out right the first time. And it's not going to. It doesn't happen that way for anybody. Um, it's, it's work. And so you have to learn to love the work. Um, and, and can I also put in a, a, a word for uh, getting help? Um, as, as somebody who, uh, who thinks, oh, I can do this. I can do this whole thing on my own. Just watch me. And then I get to a certain point and I think I'm, I'm completely stuck. And then it is really helpful to have uh, a good friend or a fantastic editor who will look at what you've seen with fresh eyes and, and, and give an idea. And sometimes it's not even the right idea, but it's enough of an idea to get you unstuck and get you back on your way. And, um, I can't, uh, I can't thank those people enough for me because because I, I need them all the time. I'm very grateful for them. Right. And and I think of it as writing buddies. Um, like I've got a friend who lives across the street. And so we don't always read for each other. But what we do is we turn on a light when we get up to work in the morning. And so you know that somebody else is working too. So if you can find a friend who is working on a book or working on their art, then you can just kind of buddy up and you know that somebody else is doing the work too where the Beatrice prophecy started um, for me. And, um, and, and that was that uh, I wrote it. Um, I wrote the like a second draft. I think I got it to, And then I um, forgot about it, literally forgot about it and found it buried in a closet eight years later and pulled it out and thought, Oh, this is, this is something, this is a story that I want to work on. So then um, I, I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And it took me a long time. And I knew as I was working that um, it would be, it was a book that kind of demanded illustrations. And uh, this is one of the only times this has ever happened where I said to all the parties concerned, I have uh, a first choice that I want to do the artwork here. And um, can, can we, see if that first choice was, and, and that was Sophie. And so he said, yes. And then after that, then after that, you called me, right? When that, when that, when that <laughs> <person did. laughs> so, so it, it has, it's kind of like a dream come true for me. Um, you know, I, and Sophie will talk about this some, but I'll just tear her up that, um, uh, we don't work together. Um, and, and that is traditionally um, the way it works uh, in the illustrated book land. Uh, uh, somebody writes the story. Somebody um, does the artwork for the story. We are kept separate. We're not together in the same room. Sophie and I happen to, to know each other um, from here and there, various conferences and stuff. We had each other's email. Um, and so a couple of times I cheated and contacted her directly. But for the most part, what happens is we talk to each other via our uh editors in the design team. So we weren't working side by side at all. Instead, what happened was during this terrible year of the pandemic, I would see these golden, literally golden pieces of art that Sophie had done for Beatrice and they provided all this comfort and light. Okay, Sophie. Oh, um, I, I, I will not uh, grow tired of talking about what it felt like to receive this book uh, and to be offered the chance to do the drawings for it because it was such a gift. It was such a, a gift of 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 this story uh, with with characters who I felt like they were friends and 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 that they will be friends forever. But it was also a gift of of things to draw. Uh, some of my favorite things, um, goats, for instance, and mermaids, and seahorses, and wolves, and moons, and princesses, and castles, and and dungeons, and and uh, and and monks, and books, and trees, and all of these things. Like I, I could I could see these pictures and what we were talking about before. Sometimes I drew them and I didn't quite remember drawing them as though I was in some kind of dream and and that I was so immersed in this story. Um, and I really did want to talk to Kate the entire time. It was an enormous 
enormous uh, uh, act of willpower to restrain myself from from sending her constant messages. Um, but at one point, I was I was so overwhelmed. I think it was partly because it was a pandemic, and we and we were in lockdown, and and life was very very strange. So so it made. Um, disappearing into this story even more appealing. But at some point I was so overwhelmed that I made Kate a gift of a of a tiny book um, that was- I, I uh, have it. You have, I have it. it. I, would it be okay to show it? I think um, it would. Okay, um, so, uh, so if you go ahead, um, uh, you talk and I'll see if I can well, get- Well, I was just gonna say that, the, that Beatrice is a story that has stories within stories. And one of the stories within the story is about a mermaid and seahorses. And so I made this, this tiny book for Kate of part of the mermaid story. Uh, and I made it inside a mussel shell because a mussel shell and lots of shells like clams and things, when you find them on the beach, if you're really lucky, you find the two halves still together and it opens up like a book and you can trace around them and make pages to go in there and then you can make a special sea book that that a mermaid might um might read and so i sent that to kate um and that can was can you all imagine what it was like to get this in the mail i mean it, it it is and i've said this a couple times sophie because we've talked together now too and i wrote this somewhere recently it it it, it feels like somebody has given you um you know, the keys to the kingdom, kind of, you've been let into a secret world, which is the way so many books in general make me feel. But here it's just so like you hold this in your hand. I keep this on my desk and um, it's a huge comfort and inspiration to me. So oh, thank, you. Well, thank you. Well, that's that's exactly how I felt when I when I received the book. So the Beatrice prophecy takes place in in a in a possibly sort of medieval time setting. It's it's not particularly clear, but it's in this this magical time long ago of of fairy tales and and folk stories, uh, and because it's a lot about books and the power of words and storytelling and reading and learning to read, but also writing and uh, the monks in the story create this this big book which is the chronicles of of chronicles of sorrowing no. yes yes yeah yep. that sorrowing. is correct sophie um, so it's, it's a really sad book but it's a beautiful book and brother edic who is um who is the 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 monk that we get to know the best uh writes in this book and and because it is such a heartbreaking book to write he makes it as beautiful as he possibly can um and so i looked at a lot of the illuminated manuscripts which were these very decorative hand lettered books um from the the 1400s and 1500s and and sometimes there's there's uh, there are books called the book of hours which is just a fantastic name for a book uh which has sort of a calendar of of kinds that's all illustrated um and there's a lot of real gold in these pages and very precious jewel-like colors. And so even though the, the, the pictures in this book are, are black and white, um, I imagined them in full color and we got to do one special color one uh, for a special edition of the book. Um, but the story itself has a lot of dark and, and sorrow and sadness uh, happening in it, but all the time there's this beauty that goes with it. Um, and I think Eric says that quite early on, doesn't he? When he finds Beatrice, uh, who has something terrible has happened to Beatrice and she has forgotten almost everything except her name. And brother Eric finds her and, and it happens to be on a day that is the most beautiful of all the days. The sun is shining, the, the meadow is full of golden flowers and there's this shaft of light I don't know if you've ever seen one of those shafts of sunlight that feels like it's got tiny pieces of gold floating in it. It was like that. But at the same time, this terrible thing had happened. And I think that's what is so beautiful and 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 compelling about this book is, is that it has all of these things happening at the same time. It's actually giving me goosebumps just thinking about it. I just wish, Sophie, that you would just go out and talk about it because it makes me want to read the book. And I, I mean, I actually... I actually think, wow, that sounds like a good book. I'd like to read it. That's how compelling you are. It is. So. It's, it's a really good book. It is. 
I will just say as far as the process and craft goes, um, and we had been talking about this earlier, and I'd like to like um, say this so that all the participants can hear it, that you can go to this collection at the University of Minnesota that's called the Curlin Collection, and you can look at all the rough drafts, my rough drafts, but other writers um, throughout the children's world. You can look at them finding their way to the story. And it is enormously comforting because when I was writing this book and, and the drafts of this book will be there and you can see this, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how it was going to work out. I didn't think that I was ever going to be able to write the story. And so the message that I want to like send to you today is uh, it, it's hard to make art to tell a story, but it is entirely uh, a worthwhile and wonderful thing to do. And you do it by doing a, a little bit each day. And so that means that even if you're in school all day, or if you're an adult and you're working all day, you still have time to, to a little bit of time to make art. And if you show up every day, you can write a book or you can um, learn to draw a goat like Sophie, maybe like Anne Swalika. And 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 I agree entirely with what Kate said that that if you that if you just do it and keep doing it and do lots of it and and know that some of those stories won't ever get finished and might stay in in the bottom of a cupboard for for eight years, which is longer than than maybe some of you have even been alive who are listening today. Um, that that you never know that that might be the story that comes out that gets finished that that takes on a life of its own. And the Beatrice prophecy, um, which, as we were saying, takes place a long, long time ago, or towards the end of the book, you'll you'll see this when you read it. There's a note that says all this happened long ago, or maybe has yet to happen. Um, and so it, it's very vague about where we are time wise, but it is a world where um, it is against the law for. Uh, girls and women to read. And, you know, that's not such an outrageous uh, concept. It happens now today in this world. Um, it's happened all throughout history. And um, so I knew that from the very beginning when I started to write the story. Um, but I didn't know, I, it, it took me a long time to figure out why that why that feeling of being silenced as a female was resonating so much in the story. So I never set out with a message. I just knew, okay, it's a world where females can't read. Um, and as I kind of like took the, the whole story apart, I came all the way back to me being uh, that person who struggled to read when I was a kid. And um, the way that we were taught uh, in school then was phonics. And for whatever reason, phonics made no sense to me at all. And uh, I was panicked um, because I knew that I wanted to read and yet I couldn't figure it out. And um, my mother, um, when I got home from school one day, um, like enraged and weepy, um, said to me, uh, oh, you know, calm down. For the love of Pete, calm down. Um, you're smart. She said that to me. You're smart. And it mattered to me that she said that. You're smart. Uh, we'll just work around it. Uh, you can just memorize the words. You're good at memorization. So she made me a bunch of flashcards. And um, that's how I learned to read. Every day after school, um, my mother took the flashcards with me and I, and I memorized the words and it worked for me. And, um, and I felt empowered. Um, and, it, and and there's a moment in this book where Beatrice, who does know how to read against the law and can write, teaches somebody else how to do it. And it's like he says, Jack Dory says, it's like a golden door had swung wide. And that's the way it was for me. And that's empowerment is that golden door when you when you understand that nobody can stop you because you can read and you can write. Yes everything that you just said. And I was just thinking as you were talking about how the, the way that you write uh, in this book and in, in um, all of your books, I think, is, is a way that, that unlocks 
the meaning of words and it and it unlocks the the truth of a story even though you often claim that you don't know what the story is about it's it's there in the sentences that you write and sometimes when i when i started to read Beatrice for the very first time. There were no pictures because I hadn't drawn them yet. It was just on my phone and I was reading it. And, and on the first page, there was a word that I thought, oh, I wonder if if how many kids will know this word? And then immediately after, there's a sentence that explains what the word is. And the word, the sentence was, and Swellica was a goat who formed peculiar and inexplicable antipathies. And I thought, oh, antipathies that's a good word and I thought do kids know what that are but what that means but the next question next sentence is she was a girl who formed peculiar and inexplicable antipathies taking an intense dislike to certain individuals so there you are you know exactly what it's like and what it means and there's another one later on about Jack Dory where it says his memory was prodigious I thought oh that's a good word and then it says, you could tell Jack Dory something once and it was in his head word for word, just as if you had said it to him, just as you had said it to him. And, and there you know what prodigious means. It means he has a fantastic memory, a tremendous memory. And I thought about uh, that that idea of, of shedding light on, on a word, which is the way that we unlock reading, you know, which is such a privilege. And I think, Kate, you and I were very lucky to grow up with, with books and parents who read to us, um, or at least one parent. Um, but uh, that idea of, of, of unlocking reading and unlocking stories is, is that shedding light on things is a bit like illumination, which yes. is, is what we were talking about before with these illuminated manuscripts, but also, you know, shining light on, on things in that way. Yeah, I was thinking about illumination as you were saying all of that. And, and so if you said one of my favorite things that I, I forget from time to time to say this, but I want to say it now, because a lot of times um, the adults in your life uh, will worry about you and whether or not you're reading and get very agitated about it. Um, and um, reading uh, is yours. It is a gift, as Sophie said, and and a privilege, and it's a joy. And so it's your journey. And um, and once you figure that out, that it's yours entirely, then you're set. No one needs to worry about you. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us today and being with us today, and also. Thank you to all of you who are reading. And the last thing that I want to say is um, the power of reading out loud to somebody. So uh, we, when we say that, we, we always think of an adult reading to a kid. But uh, you as a child can read to your parents. You can read to your grandparents. You can read to your siblings. You can read to your dog. It's a really wonderful thing to do for somebody to read them a story. So uh, read aloud to somebody. And um, I'll see you next year at the National Book Festival, I bet. Sophie? Uh, yes, I, I, I hope we get to see you in person um, sometime soon. And in the meantime, uh, I am so excited for you to read this book. The first thing I thought about when I finished it was, I can't wait for other people to read this book so that I can talk to them about it. Um, and so I'm talking to you about it now, but you probably haven't read it yet, but some of you might have, but more of you will. And then I can't wait to talk to you after that um, because it, 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 it's a good one. I think you're going to like it. Uh, so, 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 so have a, have a happy reading time and a happy summer. Hi, my name is Sasha Dowdy, and this is my daughter, Summer. I work here at the Library of Congress. I'm actually standing right in front of the Jefferson Building of the Library. I hope you're enjoying this year's National Book Festival. In addition to these author interviews, I also want you to know that the library has resources available for you all year long, like ideas for games you can do together with your family. In this video, we will share an example of an item in the library's American Folklife Center, whose collections include recordings of traditional arts, cultural experiences, and oral histories that preserve the songs, stories, and other creative expressions of people from diverse communities. 
Summer and I are going to try a jump rope rhyme and a hand clap game that were recorded in a fourth grade classroom in Virginia more than 40 years ago. The kids in this class would be about 50 years old today, maybe the age of your parents, grandparents, and other adults you know. These are the kinds of traditions that are passed down through generations and between friends. I bet you have your own rhymes and games too. You can do yours together now or follow along with us to learn some new ones. Say, say, oh, play, play, boom, boom. And we'll be jolly friends forever and more, 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 more. Cinderella, dressed in yellow, went upstairs to kiss a fella. Made a mistake, kissed the snake. How many doctors did it take? One, two, three, four, five. These stories and more are collected and preserved here at the library. I hope you'll come back and explore more anytime at loc.gov. Thank you.